Let's make sure we're live. Okay, so we're officially live. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Happy Valentine's um, my name is... <laughs> yes, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Hey, guys, welcome back to my channel. It is Charles from the channel Books on Stereo, and we're here today to talking about the Baron Knuckle Bastard trilogy with the Sarah McLean. That's me. Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, so if everyone can go around and introduce themselves, and then we will dive right into the books. Hi, so Carrie, I'm I will start you first. Oh, sorry. I'm so excited right now. I can't even tell you. <laughs> My name's Carrie. I'm with Book for Romance, and I'm fangirling right now. It's okay. I'll get over it, but not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Alicia. Okay. I'm Alicia with Alicia underscore Reads. I am uh, super excited to talk about this. I have my Sarah McLean from Jordan Fight uh, Read Romance Fight the Patriarchy mug ready to go, and I have my Read Books and Fight the Patriarchy T-shirt. I am like you ready. McLean. I am. I'm like ready to go. You're taking so, down toxic masculinity right now. I am one <laughs> one cup of coffee and book at a time. <laughs> All right, Natasha. Hey, I'm Natasha. I am Book Diva 401 on Instagram. I'm excited to be here. I am in the middle of an ice storm. So if you lose me, I'm so sorry, but just know that I'm excited to talk to you. Um, I've read book one and two and I haven't gotten to three yet, but I, I love, I love this series. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm glad you all enjoyed it because that is always the fear that you're going to pop into a chat and they're going to be like, well, this was terrible. Let's talk about why you should never write another word again. <laughs> that is the stress. The secret is that is the stress dream that all authors have when they are on deadline, <laughs> that they're at an event and someone is, it's not an empty room. It's a we hated it. <laughs> oh no! Well, you won't. I'm <laughs> no. that here. You're not going to get that here. You're not going to no, get that. Definitely here. not. Well, then no, let's no. get started. <laughs> okay. So let's start with book one, Wicked and the Wallflower. We have Devil and I brought. I'm so bad. I forgot the heroine's name just before. Felicity. 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 And he calls her that the whole time, Felicity Faircloth. It's like, right. it's not just Felicity. There's no little nickname. It's like Felicity Faircloth. And like, it's, I imagine he has this like deep, gravelly like voice. And oh, <laughs> devil. So good. He calls now, her that for a reason, though. Me. It's like, first of all, if you you must know people. You must. Have, everybody has a person in their life who they refer to as their full name, just because like. <laughs> that's just how they refer to them and mm -hmm. I have a dear dear friend like of 20 years and I still call her like first and last name always so yeah. there's that mm -hmm. but also um I don't know if you guys caught this but it's a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin um and so I Felicity no. has this like oh. very um Felicity has a very it's I mean it's not a retelling but it's thematically Rumpelstiltskin uh -huh. and uh, Felicity has I wanted her to have a really fairy tale name like the kind of name that would feel like a fairy tale mm -hmm. right that actually now that you say that I'm like I kind of yeah, see yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, like her, when, he, when like, she like comes home people. and he's in the dark and he's like I yeah. know how to get like I can do the thing that you can't do it's a uh, I mean, I, maybe I failed at it. But the concept no, was no, like, no. Yeah, no, no, I totally see that. Um, I see it now. I'm just a very bad, like, like, if no. it's not like a beast, I'm like, mm, I don't know my fairy tales. And I have a child. I so, know, you know, well, Russell Stiltskin is also real dark. Like, it's not a great yeah, fairy right. tale. Uh huh. <laughs> um, I just want to kick off and say this because I come from fantasy. Like I love fantasy romance and you single handedly got me to read historical romance. Hands down. Oh, I'm in love with your rules of scandal series by far. No one's touched it yet. It's there. It's <laughs> at the top. And um, I want to tell you devil reminds me so much of Kaz Bleeker of six of crows. And I'm so excited 
to get a <laughs> hero. I've been dying for a hero like him to find him again. And I found him and I'm like, they're similar. And I'm like, oh, I just love him. I love oh, Double. That's and it's so like, funny. I love well, it. I mean, I wonder, she, there must have been something like in the, in the water because they came out, I think, pretty close to each other. Right. We're right. And, and it was just, yeah. It was so I can awesome. see that, I though. <laughs> I'm I, glad. Well, I mean, that's a big compliment. I love that book so much. <laughs> I just, you know, I tried to find her heroes and heroines I absolutely love. And I'm just like, I tried to find them in other stories. And I, mm -hmm. it's hard for me because they're so particular, but I'm just like, oh, I just love Devil because you just nailed it with him. Like mob boss, like total <laughs> down in the dirt guy. And like, it just, mm, it was just so good. So good. Thank you. Oh. Um, I have a question that kind of is like an overall through the whole series. So there's these four characters and I'm sure everyone who is watching this has obviously already read the book. So this is not like news to anybody. But they're all born on the same day to the same man, different mothers. Where did that kind of idea come from in your mind? Like, did you see something and you're like, oh, this would be awesome. Let me make it like <laughs> three hot dudes and then a hot chick and we'll put them all together and see what happens. Like, where did it come from? Uh, yeah. So it came from, I know somebody who in real life, like in 20. 20 exists and she is uh the only daughter of a, a couple who like really really wanted a son and so she was raised not to she was raised with sort of disdain for anything that she might enjoy or love as that is traditionally considered like feminine. So she was raised to like be sporty and like work on like work in 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 the garden on on her parents' land and like do all the things that traditionally a son would fill the role of in a kind of old fashioned way. But obviously this is a pretty old fashioned family when you sort of know mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean that sort of blows my mind generally just as a kind of how does this family exist in 2020, but I appreciate that a lot of families do exist like this. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of thought like, well, what if, like, what does that look like? I'm always, anytime somebody tells me a wild story now, I'm like, what does that look like in history? Like historically. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. often what you find is that the truth in contemporary world in 2021 is almost easier to tell if you wrap it in a historical setting. And so for me, right. It was like, well, what does it look like if a girl is born and it should be a boy? Like, how is it, how mm -hmm. is that child, what becomes of that child? And so for me, the fascination was always Grace. Like, who is she? Like, she's nobody. And she doesn't have a name. Like, she's baptized with a name that's not supposed to be hers, with a title that she'll never own. Like, mm -hmm. she's hidden away. Mm -hmm. Who does she become? Right. And then it was sort of like, Literally the moment I figured out that she was the heroine, like that this was the story I was going to tell. It couldn't be the first story in the series because that's just not how romance works. It has to be the last story in the series. Mm -hmm. And then right. it was very quickly like, well, whoever the child is, who, whatever boy wins this kind of Hunger Games style concept mm -hmm. has to be her hero because he took everything from her. So he has to give it all back. Like only he can grovel enough to return it to her. And so mm -hmm. said, and then of course it was a question of like spending two, three and a half years kind of freaking out about like the fact that eventually I was going to have to pull this off. Mm -hmm. And you did, like, and you did. Like, I mean, you did. very yeah. well. Like, I'm oh, very Sarah, grateful. I, okay. Yeah. Well, Natasha, I don't want to spoil was... book three for you, though. No, so it's okay. It's I'm okay. gonna be careful. I have a bad memory, so I'll wait for a little while to read it, and okay. then I'll be good to go. Fair okay. enough. <laughs> We like okay. we pre-warned Natasha that we were gonna like go there. So she's ready. I was like, I was like, when she said she didn't read book three, I was like, book three was my heart and my soul. I, <laughs> I was like, Sarah, know. stop, book stop this problem. I need them to get together. <laughs> book I mean, one was oh, so I love good. Grace so I mean, much. The heroine knowing how to like pick locks and stuff. 
brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like I, yeah. I'm going to call you brilliant probably like 50 times tonight. So just kind I mean, of like pop fun. over that word. But I mean, <laughs> honestly, the things you did to intertwine your series, brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so, so many scenes. I'm just like, I'm just laughing my butt off. I have stuff written down like, I'm going to quote you back to you, but I mean, <laughs> so good, so good. Pesto is the quiche but, of the eighties. Oh. An old when Harry met Sally quote. Yeah. Bring me back yeah. to me. Right. Go on. Right. <laughs> I mean, I just love how you took him and, and then like devil in that, when he was like locked in the freezer and she had to like pick her locks and mm -hmm. get to him. And I'm just like, yeah. Get that lock, girl. Just one more. You got this. Like, you just with the characters the whole time. It was just so good. Sorry. Uh -huh. No, I'm so glad that you love. I mean, that Felicity, the locksmith piece for Felicity came from, um, I like podcasts, which will come as no surprise to people who know that I have one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, very, very into a podcast called 99% Invisible, which is a podcast that's actually about design in the world, like why things are designed the way that they are designed. And it does, it's been around for a long, long time. And now every once in a while they do kind of a history thing about, you know, the history of the design of something. And there was a time in history where there was such a thing as perfect security. So literally there was a period of time where there was a lock that was made so well that it was unpickable. And um, it was sat in the books in the front uh, window. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm going to get a little nerdy here. Um, okay. But it sat in, in the window of a, of a locksmith's <laughs> uh, of a locksmith's shop in London. And with the understanding, and it, it was, uh, there was a sponsorship for it, that if you could pick this unpickable lock, you would win something like 2000 pounds, which at the time was like a hundred thousand dollars, like a what? ton of money. Wow. And um, people would come from all over to try to pick it. And they actually sent it to a prison in America where like the most, um, like the, the man who had picked the most locks ever in the history of the world and been caught was told if he could pick it, they would set him free and he couldn't pick it. Oh. And um, finally, and it, so it's, it did, it happened, it lasted for about, 11 years or something that people tried to pick this lock and it was unpickable. And then finally someone did. And I was like, what if that someone, so what, cool. like I said, from the beginning, cool. like, what does that look what like in a romance novel? Yeah, right. Awesome. And so it was like, well, obviously it's not going to be a hero. It's going to be a heroine who can pick locks right. because like women have to be able to mm -hmm. open doors in different ways. Men can just walk through them. So, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I loved, I loved that like analogy of that throughout the whole thing where it's like she had to learn to pick these locks because she had to make her own way because no one's going to do it for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, right. mm -hmm. Like when you started researching this, were you like, I need to learn all about how ice is shipped during this <laughs> time? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> their, whole business, their whole business on the dock is this ice. Mm -hmm. And I, I right. never would have occurred to me and as you know, as you start thinking about these books, I'm like, oh my God, she had to really research how this all goes. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that, but that's so interesting. I mean, like ice, the, I, ice is so interesting, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really yeah, fun yeah, at parties. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, like, fridge, right? You're not like putting things in a fridge. You're not no. saving it. Like ice yeah. is like a very valuable commodity. It's it is the extremely. vodka of yeah. now. You it is know? the vodka like, of now. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if we're all homeschooling, it is the vodka now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is so much really fascinating information on the ice trade. Um, and it and I did. I mean, I tend, as you can probably imagine, just from the, the 10 minutes that we've been talking, like I go down the rabbit hole hard when I decide like this is what I'm writing about. And then I learn absolutely right. everything that I can learn about it. And then I use it for about three sentences. I tell the story in three sentences in a book and then feel like, well, what did I do for six months while I was researching this? But then I can, you know, tell fun stories on on Zoom. <laughs> right. So that's what I do. <laughs> My value <laughs> in the world. Um, but yeah, the best the best of those stories is like the ice ice would melt, obviously, because the ships weren't great. I mean, yeah. 
it's not, there are no refrigerators, there's no refrigeration. So it would melt and the ships would come up the Thames and they had to come up at high tide because if they came up at low tide, they would get stuck in the silt of the river and like just get stuck there. And they'd have right. to be, you know, emptied, unloaded from the middle of the river in order for them to lift up when high tide came the next time. So um, mm. literally, I the story goes that these ice ships would come in and they'd be basically sinking. Like, you know, the water would be right up at the level of the deck because there was so much water in the hold. Oh. oh. Interesting. That's fascinating. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. Oh. You have to do a lot of research to these You're books. You're all very kind. To... <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just curious no, about the research you had to do. I'm sorry? What were some of the research you had to do for some of these books? Like, did you already, like, know this from, like, research before? Or did no, you have no, to no. Do no. <laughs> no. I mean, the locks came, obviously, I was listening to that podcast, and I was like, oh, it's clearly that that's what is going to be in my next book. I knew I wanted to write criminals. I mean, it, it's no surprise that I like writing criminals. I mean, I, you're, you talked about the Rules of Scoundrel series. Like, I really like people who are kind of bad. And so... Mm -hmm. I, I'm much more interested in somebody who's bad than in somebody who's good. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I was really interested in, I didn't want to write about the aristocracy anymore, really. Ironically, like the aristocracy sort of looms over this series, but these men are noble without having titles. And I wanted to think right. about like, what does it mean to be mm -hmm. noble, but not have, you know, uh, the trappings of nobility. And right. also I was really interested in mm -hmm. getting out of Mayfair and talking about like, who are the people who built this city? Like the rich mm. people own it, but like who builds, who, who built it? And so for me, well, knowing that that's the direction that I wanted to go in, knowing that that's really where over the last decade, my career has, my interest as a writer has been moving toward these characters. Um, you know, things like, lock picking or I don't know how oh, ice came to me because I was in, I was in London. I try to get to England twice a year um, for lots of reasons. My mom's English. And so I go to see family, but then also I try to go twice a year, twice a year for research. I always do like one big research, research. trip. <laughs> research. For research. <laughs> and I was in London and I had a taxi driver who was incredibly chatty and, and I told him what I did. And he said that he had had, a grandfather, his grandfather or his great grandfather had been an ice seller in Covent Garden Market. And literally the way that this worked is you would get these, these people would go to the docks and they would buy a block of ice and then they would shave, essentially they would, they would make um, snow cones of some kind or, you know, they would shave it and right. then pour mm -hmm. like, like mm -hmm. berry syrup or lemon syrup on it and sell it in, in Covent Garden Market. But you'd have to go down to the, to the dock at whatever time, pick out an ice block, clean it up, and then spend your day kind of hawking this like pretty cheap treat around Covent Garden. And right. I was like, that's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I wonder how the ice got in here. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then it was like, oh, well, it came in on these boats and like, what else came yeah. in on these boats? And like, what a good right. way to smuggle, smuggle mm -hmm. stuff in. Um, and then that's also how Wit got his love of sweets, this idea of like being able to make lemon ice. Mm -hmm. I love oh. that about him too. <laughs> that's awesome. Question for Sarah. <laughs> oh. You knew, you knew this is gonna we come knew that. Like, I, knew. I, I was like, you can't like yeah. drop these like hints about a book and go all the fourth, and now you know we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna harp on it, right? Yeah. Um Bombshell with uh, Bombshell actually has been really fun to write. Um Going back to Cecily, Cecily was always fun. To, so the, the heroine of Bombshell is Cecily Talbot, who is the remaining unmarried Talbot sister from yeah. um, the Scandal oh, and Scoundrel series, which, uh, and so I sort of had always planned at the back of Day of the Duchess, it says like, stay tuned, there will be a novella for Caleb and Cecily. And then when I started writing Bare Knuckle Bastards, I was, I almost immediately had the idea for Hell's Bells. And then I was like, Oh no! Wait, <laughs> right. Cecily can't have a novella. She has to be a bell. Like the, uh, this is her destiny, and so um, 
it was really fun going back. I mean, all my series overlap and there's always, right. there's, there's sort of a big like McLean universe. And so it was really, it's been very fun to go back and like resurrect a lot of these older characters and to see all of these older characters again. Um, the balance of new story and old characters has been really tough for me. Like my editor kind of quietly will be like, maybe they don't need to know all of this about Serafina and Mal. And I'm like, but they do. They, do, right. they don't. You right. don't need to know this for the story. But like, there are so many. So that's been really fun. And um, the way that I'm pitching Bombshell, that I'm sort of talking about Bombshell and the way that it's all, it's been in my head for what now four years almost or the way that i'm talking about hell's bells rather is um imagine it's sort of like the a team <laughs> meets victorian okay. london but like make it feminist and also make sure there's kissing Oh wow! Uh, so, so, <laughs> I uh, need the arc of this. I if you don't know anything about the A team, what I will say is that uh, you shouldn't look it up after this description because it'll sound <laughs> totally crazy. Um, but basically, it's like a team of ex soldiers who are all just a little bit crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and right. um, and there's like uh -huh. the the amu the munitions expert and the like sexy bombshelly guy who can seduce anyone and the one Hannibal, the one who uh, he who loves it when a plan comes together. And um, you know, the the smarter, kind of cerebral guy. And so I when I put together the bells, I was like, these are the archetypes that I want to play with. The like leader. And for people who read the casino series, like this won't come as too much of a surprise. Although right. one of the bells whose name is Imogen is <laughs> like truly i'm not actually sure like she's book three of the series because i'm she's so totally fun to write as like somebody who knows how to create essentially she's like you can do amazing things if you like shove a rag into a bottle of gin and set it on fire <laughs> which is very fun to I have and like That's the awesome. book one but like ultimately i have to calm her down <laughs> um, but not not yet so they're fun it's just a really fun series. Like if you take all the things, all the moments in my other series where you see the characters just like going balls to the wall, like right. that's where we are with Hell's Bells. Like the idea is what if we just, what if I just write this series that gives me a lot of joy and hopefully gives readers mm -hmm. a lot of joy. I just, I wrote it in 2020 and it felt like I'm just gonna take the gloves off and like write something that's amazing. I mean, and how that, that, that makes me feel amazing. amazing. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. How many books uh, are gonna be in it? Four, four. five, three, four, okay. Four. four. So Cecily yes. is the first and she is the bombshell. She is like very similar to the character that you know Cecily to be. She's, you know, a real, she's, she's, um, Nobody thinks twice when Cecily leads like a man down a dark garden path and nobody really notices when he doesn't come back. So um, oh, it's fun. a, it's a fun, it's like, so I think you will all be very happy with Cecily's book. Caleb, of course, notices when he doesn't come back. And that's like chapter one of the book. Oh, okay. Awesome. I am so excited oh. for that oh. series. I like need it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you'll get it end of August. <laughs> okay, end of I'm August. So and then, well, you guys will probably get it sooner. You'll get ours. So. Oh, well, thank you. The, um, I'm going to go on NetGalley. Yeah. Request, request, request. I know, I'm like on NetGalley, like, <laughs> Well, it's not there yet because it's not copy edited yet. But <laughs> soon enough. <laughs> and if people want to order it, you want uh, in your Word. Word in Brooklyn is your indie, right? And everybody gets yes. they, you sign them. Yay. You can get it from Word. Um, wordbookstores.com um, or wherever you read okay. read your books. Awesome. Nice. And I think yeah. Chris just posted yeah. a, a, um, a question and everyone knows Chris is a nurse. So she got her second COVID shot today and is feeling a little <sighs> under the Chris, weather uh, today. Yeah. So right. Natasha is mm -hmm. up and, Thank you for um, everything, Chris. Thanks for all your hard work. Yeah. Well, uh, but she has a question. What is, uh, 
what authors have you stalked to be your friend? <laughs> Chris, Chris listens to my podcast because yes. basically I have stalked every one of my friends to be my friend. <laughs> Um, now you're friends with Lisa Claypus, so yeah, whatever. except I'm it not all really out, friends with what? Lisa Claypus. Like I, I mean, yeah, we were in a hotel together for like three days, and forced, and she was forced to have meals with me, and so now <laughs> I'm like, well, we're obviously friends. <laughs> like, yes. that makes us friends, Lisa. Yes, <laughs> it does. It does. Right, um, it totally does. My my Lisa Claypus story. I think I've told this on the podcast, though, is that uh, when I first, the very first time I was introduced or anywhere near Lisa, I was with my editor, who is also Lisa's editor, and I we walked into a room at a conference, and Lisa was standing not far from me, and I am a huge... <laughs> surprising no one I'm a huge Lisa Kleypas fan and I saw her and I went oh my god that's Lisa Kleypas and my editor was like come over and I will introduce you and I literally turned I peeled off from my editor and left the room because <laughs> <laughs> I was like no way that's not happening <laughs> oh my gosh so yeah that was me being really cool. And then, uh, and no, but other authors who I've stalked to be my friends mean many of my closest friends are people who I have basically forced to be my friend. So Sophie Jordan, um, Adriana Herrera. Sophie. Yeah. Mm. Can, I, uh, can I ask about one author? Sure. One author in particular, because you got an arc of her book. And I'm going to ask. Sarah J. Moss. Yes, you did. <laughs> It's all anybody wants to talk about. Oh my God. I'm just curious because both my, because you're Sarah and she's Sarah and you both are my favorite mm -hmm. authors. So that's okay. Cause you're different genres. Thank you. And, <laughs> she's like, amazing. What do you think? Like star wise, what did you rate her new book? Like, Oh, wise. it's terrific. It's now look, it's terrific. And I'm not a fantasy reader. Right. So like for me, there's a lot in this book where I'm like, well, that's just about fairies, so fine. Like, I'll just buy right. that, <laughs> right? right? If a book has a map, I'm like, okay, there's going to be a lot in here that I'm not going to follow, but I'm in it. No, it is so... I I read it in one sitting. It's like a thousand pages long. I read it in one yeah, sitting. Whoa. Um, oh, whoa. I mean, it's, it's maybe not a thousand pages. It's like close to 800 pages long. 800, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then um, I read it in one sitting, and well, I'll show it to you. Hang on. Oh, oh my God, Carrie's gonna die. <laughs> Carrie's gonna is literally gonna just like curl into a ball. She's gonna just guys. It's Carrie. so long. They had to send me send it to me in two pieces. How do I show this to you? Oh my oh, God! Sorry. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um. So like, this is the first half, and then this is the second half. Anyway, so um, it is bananas <laughs> sexy. Like bananas sexy. There is a point. So it's basically like it's a terrific enemies to lover story. So this is a court of silver flames by Sarah J. Moss. Um, it's a remarkable enemies to lover story. At one point, there's this moment. I mean, like, I don't want to spoil it. It's not my book. So okay, yeah, it's like I can't say very much, <laughs> but what I can say, I feel like Sarah would not. I feel like Sarah would be fine with me saying this as a promotional okay. tool. Okay. Okay. There is like a sex scene in this book where I was like, this is hotter than most romance, right? Like right. there and he right. so okay. they they have sex. I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell the story. They have sex and then <laughs> and then she's like, well, and he kind of like has to go. So he goes and then the next time we see each other, she's like, Well, you clearly regretted having sex with me. And he's like, the only thing I regretted is that I didn't get a chance to go down on you. Ooh. And then there's a three page Ooh. cunnilingus scene. And I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> so okay, Carrie, I appreciate Carrie that you want to talk about yeah. like the nuances of the cauldron and the fairies and everything that goes Ooh. on. <laughs> Look, he goes down on her for three solid pages. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there he is. Okay, that's, yeah. See, Carrie is trying to get me to be And I, I'm not. I mean, I'm just going to get right to it. <laughs> yeah. But this, this, you need to sell it this way, Carrie. This yes. way. 
Like it doesn't need to be like, nobody. All right, We're everybody like, watching this, like, go tweet about the fact that this is what I said about this actually truly magnificent <laughs> enemies to lovers story. Right. <laughs> Where did I go that way, Sarah? I'm like, it's such a good book. There's great fantasies mixed with romance. No, I sell it the wrong way each time. They're like, nope. Just tell me that. Like, I mean, okay, I'll I mean, read it. How many pages? That. What happened? Yeah. This, is, this is what I, I need. I where it gets that. steamy for me. <laughs> you can all tweet about this when it's like when it's out you can say hey it was really funny when Sarah McLean said that thing <laughs> oh my god this is but so for now, awesome it's this really like, terrific enemy slivers romance <laughs> I had I'm talking with my favorite author about another one of my favorite authors this is like my year you guys have made my year. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie's done reading for the year. Like, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is 2021. Highlight, highlight of 2021 right here. <laughs> um, now you just need a shirt to, to memorialize all that. I talked to my yeah. favorite author about my other favorite author. My favorite, favorite author. Right. <laughs> Lady Whistledown XO, please help me with this. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Oh, oh are so we? I um, do have a question about the. I have to get to my favorite book, Daring and the Duke. Like, mm -hmm. like Sarah, like I want to know, like, how did you know to like the right amount of grovel that you and had to go through? Because I was ready, like, by chapter three, I'm like, just, just be with him, Grace. Just be with him. Yeah. No. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> oh, no. It was like just the right amount. I was like, and then when it shifted, I was like, I'm done. Like, this book is like, like, yeah. I, I can't top this. Well, I'm really glad. So it, everybody who knows me knows that I love a grovel, right? Like, I think I've, I really planted that flag. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, all heroes must grovel, right? At some point. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, you, it's a bad dude. Charles, right. <laughs> like he's done some really bad stuff, and yeah, I mean he has reasons because he's you know poor sad Ewan. But mm -hmm. I had to forgive him, and so did Grace. And also, I think Grace is tremendously loyal as a care. Like she is somebody who who um, takes care of Grace's people far more than she takes care of Grace. Right? Like she takes care right. of her brothers and her brother's mm -hmm. family and the garden and all the people who work in her club and her friends and her like everybody comes before grace and he mm -hmm. and ewan has hurt all of these people and mm -hmm. um and so he needs to come to terms with the fact that in order for him to win her he needs to one acknowledge that she's not the same as she was when she was a child like the they're right. evolved like she's an evolved person now right. and then he has to realize that like the way that he wins her is by winning everyone else right so mm -hmm. like there's that scene in the garden i think the turning point of that book is the scene where yeah. he's like basically doing penance for the for coven garden and mm -hmm. what right. he's done there yeah. and like she that's when she starts to see like oh maybe he's maybe he's not the worst Right. Um, and then, of course, the the grovel. I mean, it just goes on and on <laughs> and on and on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, it's yeah. so good, though. <laughs> like, and there then was the one ending, part. but the ending is like the whole the whole point of it is that, like, mm -hmm. right. ultimately, you can say you're sorry until forever, but mm -hmm. you know, you need you need to blow it all up. It you essentially burn it like to the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, there. Yeah. It's interesting because that is a decision. I knew what was going to happen at the end of book three. I mean, the second I came up with the idea for the series, I knew what had to happen, yeah. right? Knowing what I knew about who the characters were, knowing that it was going to be the girl who had no name and the boy who essentially stole her life and right. knowing what would have to come of it. Like these two could not live happily ever after with him like, taking a seat in parliament that was right. never going to be the solution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um right. but it was a there was a lot of concern both for me and from other people who were around the book that it wouldn't be well received by readers that ending but it was the ending 
and readers right. loved it. So I'm very happy with the way that it went. Yeah. Um, but right. there was a lot of concern that like at the mm -hmm. end, him making the choice that he did and them ending up living the life that they ended up living would take away essentially like the appeal of a Duke. And mm -hmm. that didn't seem to happen. But like for me, the whole series was about taking away the appeal of the aristocracy. Like yeah. that's right. not, that's, that doesn't have value really in a modern mm -hmm. right. construct. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Is there a character that you wish you could go back and write differently? Mm -hmm. Now that the series is, you're almost to the end with the fourth book coming out. Um, you mean in this series in Bare Knuckle Bastards? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. No, I think it's been a while since I've thought about the earlier books, but I'm, I think I'm pretty happy with them with the, at least with the main characters. I don't think I would change right. anything about them. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a good question. I wouldn't though, change like, anything. Certainly like <laughs> there have been characters in my <laughs> lifetime as a writer who now looking back, I sort of think like, Oh, that was really a hard, it was a hard road to travel. And I wish I had, you know, made different choices maybe, but, okay. um, but generally like this series, I'm very proud of the bastards in the sense that right. like it, the, the series did what I wanted it to do. It achieved mm -hmm. what I wanted it to achieve. And that's really all you can ask mm -hmm. for as a writer and readers seem to really resonate to it, which is yeah, yeah. nice. Like, I wanted yeah. you guys to fall in love with these kind of seedier, the seedier side of mm -hmm. London and all the people who yeah. live there and like all the people who were working there. And yep. it felt like people <laughs> really did. And actually Nicole, Nicole just took one of my questions. So if you want to put it up, Charles, I want to know, see, there we go. get a novella for Nick and Nora? Like <laughs> uh, you will see Nick and Nora again in Bells. Um, they are around, they're, they're, okay ancillary bells um you'll okay. this will all sort of become clear when bombshell comes out but the bell right. there are four there are four books in the series four. but hell's bells is a much broader concept than these four women um so you'll see them again i would really like to give them a novella i'd like to give them like a really lovely like christmas novella or a really like steamy christmas novella um <laughs> but also i sort of feel i often feel this way i i set secondary characters on the page and I give them like a little teaser of a love story like Caleb and Cecily, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Um, although Nick and Nora are slightly different because they are kind of tied up. At the, they're together at the end of Brazen and the Beast mm -hmm. and they're together mm -hmm. in Daring and the Duke on page. So, and then I sort of think like, oh, well, what's the story that I would tell in a novella that's not already kind of there? So right. I think mm -hmm. that's the trick with them is like figuring out like, do I go back and tell Nick and Nora's love story um, like on the edge of Brazen and the Beast? So it's the same time frame. Like what, right. what is the right No, I want to see them now. Like how they're living together. They like, like love each really other and bone a lot, yes. Alicia. Like that's, what do yes. you want? That's, <laughs> that's, 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 Whatever you would like, I'll read. So it doesn't matter. You put it anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but um, getting back to um the heroines, I love Lady Georgiana, which is from the Rules of Scoundrel series, and I loved Grace, those strong heroines when she had the coat that was flopping backwards. I mean, that reminds me so much of sci-fi. Like, I feel like. That's why I kind of transitioned so well into historical because you have the elements of these, like you can have these feminist characters and they're so badass. Like I just, I want a girl assassin to just be like, I'm, you know, I'm going to yeah. just, and then like by day yeah. she's pretty and feminine and by night she can kill you. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. um, that there's something really interesting happening with historical right now. Like we're living a really interesting time in historical romance. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I, I think that historical kind of took a dip and and now we're we're coming back as, and, and for whatever reason, but I think part of the reason is that in historical, you can write characters who are truly extra, 
<laughs> right? Like, Still, no, 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 no. Like, whereas, like right. in contemporary right now, what we're seeing so much of is, um, like characters who are very realistic, characters who are noble and kind and decent and good and who give us a lot of like warm feelings and and give us a they're like a they're like a cuddly blanket right mm -hmm. historical tends to, is currently really giving us like fantasy these right. like giant extra people and so watching them mm -hmm. kind of lets us release a lot of the reality that we're having to deal with and i think mm -hmm. That's kind of a gift. Mm -hmm. to, that's a gift to me as a writer. As a re I think one of the reasons why Hell's Bells is such a big, a big series for me in terms of like how I envision it being kind of a sprawling world with these like big sprawling characters is because right. it's mm -hmm. I'm able to really live in it um, mm -hmm. as almost right. as though mm -hmm. it's fantasy, right? Yeah, um, no, so yeah. I think right. that's what you're. That's what you're seeing. That's certainly what you're seeing in Grace, like with the corsets and the, like a mm -hmm. kind of steampunk aesthetic, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So cool. Um, I, I love yeah. a strong heroine. I just finished <laughs> um, the second book and Hattie, the year of Hattie, I was like, Aww. girl, take charge of your life. Go, go, give <laughs> you what you need. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, yes. in the beginning when they come across this unconscious man, and so they tie him up and she like kicks him out of the carriage. I'm like, Heard. yes. She has things to do, Natasha. Yes. <laughs> yes. And she has I to keep it. to it. I loved it. I loved it. You know, and I, I really love to see that portrayed in that in historicals because when I, I haven't been in historicals very long. And one of the fears when I first got into it was I don't want to read about a bunch of women that don't have control, any kind of control over their life, because that mm -hmm. time period just mm -hmm. was a little bit scary to me. I could mm -hmm. not imagine living in that time period. So reading mm -hmm. strong heroines that really take charge, I'm like, this is fucking fantastic. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but you know, I love it. Like, this is great. So I'm really glad. And I feel like it's not just it's not it's not just me. Like there are so many historical right. writers who are mm -hmm. writing these right. kinds of heroines right now. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just, I feel like we're in a kind of historical Renaissance right now. Yeah. And I'm here for it. It's cool. I'm me too. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> I like when she ties him up. But that's just <laughs> yeah. That one, that opening to You're bring the was like iconic. Like, you know, I, I I'm all about that on so many levels. Yeah. So many. I like. I liked your play on words too. Like one of the scenes in Brazen and the Beast, you're like, um, you wrote, uh, you have Beast now. It's beauty's. It, it's oh wait, now beauty has his turn. Like they're switching in the ring. It's devil, like, right? Yeah. Right, but and he's got you know, a. I mean, devil is right. deep, like devil. wicked scar down his face. Mm -hmm. Not beautiful at all. Yeah, we're, right. thank you. You're just yeah. brilliant. Like the I mean, in, like beast. He's beautiful. So why would you call him beast? But it's just like so good. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Sorry. I do. I mean, I miss. I miss those characters a lot because they. It was a really fun write. It was a fun series to write. It was really. Um, I've talked about this before, but like my dad died in the middle of Wicked and the Wildflowers. So for me, like that was a really like, there was a lot about that book that is, that felt very emotional to me, even though, you know, there's an, it's not like there's a lot of dad issue in there. It's just like it, something, you know, when stuff is happening outside of your life, in, in your life, it gets into the book in ways. And then when I was writing Brazen and the Beast, I mean, I feel like Brazen and the Beast is like the book of my heart in some ways. Authors often talk about this, like what's the book that feels closest to them? And for me, Brazen really feels that way. Like it feels like it is the book that, you know, I've been writing for 12 years, which doesn't seem like very long, but also in romance feels like an eternity. Mm -hmm. And it feels like Brazen was really the book where I felt grown up in romance all of a sudden, like, I felt like, okay, here's me as a grown, as an adult in romance, like writing. And then, um, like I said before, Daring in the Duke, just, I knew I had a vision for what I wanted to do. And I wrote toward it without, like, while closing out, like, a lot of voices that told me this book was going to be impossible. And um, mm -hmm. so the, you know, and you always, you sort of 
you live like kind of with your breath held when a book is coming out and you sort of hope that, mm -hmm. you know, lots of us writers say like, oh, we don't look at reviews, but of course, like, I see your posts go by. <laughs> when I see them go by, I'm like, oh, what's that? What did they say? Right. And, and so mm -hmm. you have this moment where you're like, well, is everybody going to see what I, what I'm trying to do? And mm -hmm. you all did. And that is a huge there's, I can't, it's hard to express the kind of joy that you get as a writer when like a reader sees you. Right. So, thank you all. Yeah. I oh, think, so oh, thank you for giving us these characters. Like <laughs> one of the things that I Gosh, loved about this yeah. trilogy as a whole was that even though yes, it's a romance, but you spend a lot of time like actually getting to know our main protagonists as well as side characters too, which I really, really enjoy. So like at the, when I was reading Wicked and Wallflower, I was like, oh, okay. Cause I'm usually like, oh, uh, like I, I'm like, it's hard for me to like delay gratification when we get to like the like this the banging part of the book. I was like, I was like the banging part. I was it's like, fine. Hold That's on. what I like, call it too. I was like, I was like wait, 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 what chapter? I was like, are we gonna? Is it gonna happen now? I was like, oh no. I was like, hold up. I didn't even think about that because I was enjoying the character so much that when it did happen, I think you mentioned this before how like um you shouldn't be skipping over sex scenes. Mm -hmm. that they actually kind of develop the characters. And I really yeah. enjoy watching that. Like when it does happen, it's really meaningful for the characters and their relationship at the time. So like the motion is actually there too. So you're like, you get the steam, but you're also getting the motion. So I wonder like how you kind of like plant those beats so successfully in this series. Oh, thank you. First of all, that's really, it's yeah. nice that you think that that is done correctly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, sex scenes, I think I've said that I'm on the record for sex scenes are the hardest part for me or the most difficult part for me. Um, and I, it takes me days to write a sex scene where it might take me, where it might take me like a day to write a chapter um, when I'm really in it. It might take me a week to write a sex scene, like, which is usually a chapter or sometimes two in my case. And mm -hmm. That's because like every word suddenly has a different kind of power um, and a different kind of weight. And often for me, so when I write, I don't plot my books at all, except I know what the ending is. That's all I know. I know like where I'm, the, I know the road I'm, I know the destination, but I don't know the journey. Okay. And um, so one, I haven't plotted them. So that means you know, if there's a sex scene on page 75 of my manuscript, I don't know my characters very well at all on page 75. So like the work of writing a sex scene that early is like exploration for me too, right? Like they're only 75 pages into their relationship and I am too. So it takes right. a different kind, okay. that's a different kind of sex scene than one that happens. Well, I almost never write sex after they've like said they're in love and like right. because all of a sudden it's not interesting to me anymore. Like this is just a having a lovely time, and like you could do that off page. Um, so, <laughs> um, like for me, sex is about. Oh, so okay. Somebody once told me. Somebody told me not long ago that like, um, somebody was looking at my chart, my astrological chart, and they they were looking, and she said to me like, "Your Venus placement is really interesting," and I was like, "Tell me about that." And she said, um, <laughs> and she said, well, it's it, it speaks to the idea that you should be having a lot of like pain and, and trauma in your love life, like in love. And I was like, well, I've been with my husband for 20 years. Like that's in itself is kind of traumatic, and but like, yes, pain like, and trauma right the there. Same, yeah. In the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. In painful. the middle of a pandemic. She's, like, yeah. she's always in my house. It's yeah. a pandemic. And she yeah. said, um, she's like, well, you know, is it possible that in your romance novels, your characters experience a lot of pain and love, like that they have to go through a lot of like pain together in love and then like come out on the other side. And I was like, oh my God, that's why they all grovel. And like, whatever, however you, astrology is a great party trick and very fun. But um, that sort of concept really stuck with me. This like idea that for me, when I write sex, it's always about like unpacking baggage. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know about the beats. I don't think too much about the beats of the actual scene. 
but I can definitely, I sort of an intuitive moment for me when they have, when they end up having sex, like it mm -hmm. feel, it always feels like the chapter afterward, they're different characters in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I think we have a few questions that we should, because yeah. we're going to try to keep it to an hour because it is Valentine's night. And oh, yeah, like, you all have. So yeah. be with like your, well, you know, we don't, we're losers. But like, I'm sure you want to go be with like your family <laughs> and stuff. So, but I know we have a bunch of yeah. questions for people who actually have questions for you. Um, here, yeah, Jackie so think... says, what, do you want to toss them up, Charles? Oh, yeah, let me, let me see if I can find Jackie's. I know Chris had one, so I'm going to start there real quick okay. and kind of go through them. The book's uh, uh, name a book that changed your life or left a huge impact on you, not your own. Well, I mean, it would never be my own. Um, oh gosh, that's so hard. I mean, there are so many, um, and I feel like you all kind of know the answers in some ways if you listen to the podcast. But um, for me, um, Lisa Claypus. It is not too much for me to say that Lisa is my purest influence. Like, as far as I'm concerned, almost every one of Lisa's books has taught me something and not just how to write, but also like about my life. I like she's she is a I can't say enough about how powerful an influence she is on me and how important it is that she her books exist in my life. Um, so and it's not actually dreaming of you probably the book that like most impacted me of hers is again the magic um which sort of um and again like it's that sort of trauma love that like yeah. really again like characters who are just constantly i'm i'm so interested in books that unpack identity and so I like, which is why I like books that are often about um, like secret identities. Like I like people who have multiple faces. Um, mm -hmm. But this book is so much about how other people impact your entire worldview and then impact who you become mm -hmm. and how you get out from underneath them. Um, romance really changed my life. I mean, I've, I've told this story before many times, but, you know, I didn't have, I, when I was about 13, I had a kind of terrible family experience and I was lost and romance saved me. And mm -hmm. Lisa was one of those writers who saved me then. And um, so like, I wish it, I wish I could say like, it was this one book at this one time, but it was really romance in general and Lisa mm -hmm. specifically. Well, I think we all have kind of talked about that, like individually on our other channels and like amongst ourselves that, you know, these books come into your life at different times to yeah. help you through something. And, you know, they're like, oh, people do it. I'm like, oh, mm. I think it's a book. <laughs> the book, yeah. I, I think people, it's a book. People like, are messy. <laughs> yeah, like, people, people require too much of me. I think a book comes into your life at a certain time to, like, help you get yeah. through things. Yeah. And then, you know, see, I was, see, I was wrong. See, I thought, I thought you would say like Julie Garwood because I just listened to that podcast the other day because I'm like rereading all of those. Sure, those totally early, so yeah. I mean, Joanna, the Joanna Lindsay, like those early, that whole, that um, school of romance, the Joanna Lindsay, Jude Devereaux, Judith McNaught, Julie yeah. Garwood, those kind of old school people, like they really lift, they, I mean, they were the books that I found when I was in, you know, when I was 11 years old mm -hmm. and read them all. And those books all taught, I mean, suddenly you could see, I felt like there was a space for, for both escape. It was that kind of big extra story that we were talking about before. Um, and then on top of it, like actually seeing characters who were, young in these cases, very young, very unfortunately young. in those early books, <laughs> like way too yeah. young, but like young and women sort of exploring the world and being able to fight and have like hit the world and have it change. And that concept mm -hmm. for me was just transformative. And I think that's transformative for a lot of romance readers. And it's something that mm -hmm. very few people talk about is like, when you're able to see a story like one of these and a character who really can like hit the wall and shatter it. You, it's, it's magnificent. And I didn't have YA, right? 
So I'm too yeah. old for YA. Well, I'm well. grateful that there are there is YA for my kids, for my kid, but yeah. you know, she wanted to read romance. <laughs> the other day, the other day she said to me, she was like on book four of some series. And she was like, I need the next, you know, three. I finish these. And I, I walked into my bedroom and I looked at my husband and I was like, we got to get this kid reading romance novels because we are spending too much money on children's books. <laughs> so, That's too funny. Yeah. And there's also another really good question. I know Carrie has a, a, another question. That I, I do. Want to get to, um, okay? but I think this I is just got Hi, up. Carrie. It's one of those times where the internet decides to fail you and it's like, Awesome. Of course he does today. Of all <laughs> um, yeah. My, okay. So one of my questions is, is that I know like people are talking Bridgerton and things like that. And I wanted to know, there was two characters in the Bridgerton series and it resembled devil and beast. And I was wondering, is anybody talking about doing That's so funny. Adaptation. Oh, oh, um, <laughs> I, uh, that, so it's interesting because you are not the first person to say that about those characters. And then I was like, wait, what, who are they? And then when I finally got there, I was like, hang on a second. My guys are way better than these two. Right, right, right. <laughs> For sure. Totally it's almost like they took from you um, and like put it in there. They just made criminals. Um, right. no, uh, uh, no tell the, the short answer is no. And so if you have friends at like HBO, you know, <laughs> text, <laughs> give them my number. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, it does feel like though, all joking aside, Bridgerton, the numbers for Bridgerton, the like 82 million households, like yeah. even in a pandemic, mm -hmm. it feels like Bridgerton is such a juggernaut that I, it feels difficult to imagine that there wouldn't be more historical. Mm -hmm. Right. um to come yeah. but it's and as I, of now not me god so. and is a part of you like, i hope mad? so call shonda let shonda know like when shonda was I behind mean, text was like, shonda everyone <laughs> right shonda okay. can do no wrong <laughs> this is the series i'd vote for because this was a genius series you start out with a hero losing everything i mean it's just brilliant it's just absolutely Mm, I just love the series so much. I love that Thank series you. so much. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, sure. They can have that one. I'm not picky. <laughs> oh, that series is so good. I, just, yeah, I mean, who knows? Uh, Your Hell's Bells could be even better. And then I'm going to be like, no, they need to do Hell's Bells. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I would really, obviously... That's the dream, what? right? Like, there's, I, I would be lying if I said, like, oh, I wasn't thinking about it. But, you know, tell your friends at HBO. Yeah. <laughs> we, sh we shall. We'll, like, we'll make a petition and, and everything. Yeah. Everybody, leave, 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 yeah, leave this and then go on LinkedIn <laughs> and <Right>. search <laughs> HBO, like yep. Amazon, Apple TV, Netflix. If you know anybody, you went to that boy you kissed, <laughs> yep. seventh grade, he works in Netflix, let him know. Just ping him. Start tweeting the hell out of everything. <laughs> tag Shonda, tag everybody. <laughs> well, I, Blow it up. Get this done. <laughs> I need the Uptown Girls by Joanna Shoup to be adapted. <gasps> I need uh, that one. Wouldn't that be yeah. amazing? Yes. Oh, Joanna is Those so books. good. Oh, she's the I best. I found one. Joanna through you, Sarah, and I was like, I read she's um the Rogue of Fifth Avenue. I was like, hold up, why haven't I not read this? <laughs> well, I mean, talk about bananas, sexy, but also like they're so lush. I don't know how romance has slept on Gilded Age, like gaslights in like mm -hmm. old money New York. Right. I mean, there's something so sexy about it. I mean, there are no titles. I guess that's why, right? Like romance loves the title, but wow, they're so good, those books. Have you read have you read all of her books now, Charles? Yeah, I read um I just finished up the four hundred series. Mm -hmm. Um because I knew Frank was in it. I was like, oh, it's Frank. 
was like, and I read the oh, Frank. Like, <laughs> oh, Frank. Like, like, this is a non, non-sexy name, right? Like, how, Joanna Shoup can take the least sexy name. Exactly. It, like, no. Sexy. Delicious. Florence? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my. The third book, I that bowling it. scene. That's Stop it. it. <laughs> That's all I got to This I texted her after I get to that. When I got to that scene, I, I, like, immediately stopped. She's another one who I stalked until she was my friend. And... God. She and I texted her and I was like, How did you just make bowling sexy? Like, how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> so um yeah. I feel like Jackie had a question. Um oh, yeah, that was a good uh, one. And then I think there were like two or three really good questions. And then um Jackie then had one about what felt magical about writing the bare knuckle bastards. Does every series feel decidedly different when you write it? There you go. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Yes, is the answer. They all feel different. Um, because, mm -hmm. and I think I'm I'm not sure if this feel this is correct for every writer. I mean, I when I think of a book, I actually don't think of my books in isolation. I think of them in the series, right? So for me, when I'm writing mm -hmm. like Bare Knuckle Bastards two, for for me, like that was Bare Knuckle Bastards two for a long, long time until I had to start talking to people about it as like having a title and having characters mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the concept is like, I want you to feel like you're moving into a, a universe with me. Like that here you are, these are the boundaries of this universe. And like, there's stuff that's happening on the outside and you can go in those rooms. Like if you want to walk into that casino, you can do that and you've got a whole nother series of books, but like right now we're here on the rooftops, right? So um, for, I mean, this is really in the weeds in terms of craft, but like the way that uh, Bare Knuckle Bastards is written is there's almost no scene in the first book that's in the, that's in the daytime. Um, and then Ooh. in the second book, that's there true. are a few scenes that are in the daytime. And then in the third book, there's a lot of light. And like, it's all, it was designed as like you, if you lived in this world with me, like I was going to bring you into the light in the bastards. And that for me was like a really, it was the first time that I'd ever kind of done something where I was thinking that big about wow. the series. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that was really magical for me. Like when I got to the end and I was like, Oh, this works. Like this is, this is working. And like, there were moments, there are obviously moments of darkness in the last book too, but the idea was that you were walk, you were taking this journey with these characters the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, the casino series was my second series. So it's a different kind of structure. Like I was playing with other things and I was a baby when I was writing it in terms of being a baby writer. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I think often with my books, I, I think, one of the things I fail at as a writer, and I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, but I'm gonna, is that every one of my books is very different from other books that I've written. You know, the books are different every time. And my hope is that by now, 13 books in, um, readers trust me that if they like read one and it doesn't really 100% work for them, like the next one will be different enough that it's worth trying again. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I right. wish that I could do that thing that so many historical writers are able to do and contemporary writers, like romance writers are able to really like nail the story every time and tell the same, mm -hmm. like write that perfect book that tastes like that author's book every time mm -hmm. yeah. and um mm -hmm. and i think that is for me always a little bit of a struggle but like that's just the way the books come out i don't try to <laughs> i don't try to do it anymore i don't I say like oh brazen yeah. was so successful i'm gonna try and write brazen again like that's surely means that 200 pages in i'm gonna have to grow it out so i don't do that anymore oh, okay. i don't play with that anymore <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like Alicia. it's different though, yeah. because then it's like you're not always getting the same thing. Like I know mm -hmm. your books because even the series is going to be cohesive, but it's going to just be for that series. And then I'm going to get a taste of something different from you. And I love that. That's something I love about you. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I hope that, I mean, I hope you do trust me. That's always the goal, right? Yes. It's like, mm -hmm. Yeah. As a writer, especially romance writer, romance, we have this covenant with readers, right? Like my covenant with you is that 
I'm going to take care of you, right? right. By the end, mm -hmm. you're going to be okay. And I'm going to make right. sure that we get there safely. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I also kind of resist the idea that like, we have to do the ride gently. Right. right. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. you better strap in. <laughs> what I will tell you is I'm we there. will get there. <laughs> the roller derby, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you, more questions? Do you yeah. do another one? Do you see how many questions, Alicia? I see a couple. Yeah. So Dana, Dana, who was part of the summer of Sarah McLean and um, one of, is now doing these new up girls. I know. I love them. We love them. Love um, them. Magnificent was, people. I we're Natasha and I are part of that as well, and we're Me too. we're reading a cat for fashion this week, and I you know I love them. So Dana wants to know: Will we see more body diversity, plus size heroines in Hell's Bell? Mm -hmm. Well, you'll see Cecily, who is curvy, um, mm -hmm. although like she's a bombshell. She's very like hourglass, like she's just mm -hmm. curvy. Right. Um, yes, you will. There are two plus size heroines. If you there's there's Cecily and another plus size heroine, um, and okay. you'll see lots of other kinds of diversity too in the series, just like you did in um, Bare Knuckle Bastards. Awesome. Uh, at least you um, said another question that you I found. Think, yeah, there was one more, and it said about the covers. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, here, yes. You, yes. Are you in charge? Yes. Do you have any control of your I'm unique, vibrant <laughs> cover, or are they just? <laughs> all from your no i do i am very lucky in that i get a say i don't get to decide <laughs> but right. i get um i get to look at them i get to give a lot of input at the beginning i live in new york city which in the before times meant that i could go to a photo shoot which was oh. great because i could oh. pick them i would pick the models i off i always pick my models um right. which is I, well, I didn't in the early days, but now, like, I picked the models for the Bare Knuckle Bastard series. I picked the model for Bombshell, although you haven't seen that cover yet, even though it's yes. gorgeous. Oh. Um, but, and then I get to go to the photo shoots, and so I can, like, play Barbies with the two people, which is <laughs> very fun. Aww. Very fun. Um, and then, um, <laughs> and then uh, I, so that's all great. And then afterward, it's really, like, Again, because I think of the books as a series, like I'm able to sit, like we knew they were going to be pink, blue, and yellow. We knew that it was going to be that sort of like radioactive, like neon color-y color. Mm -hmm. And so um, we knew I want, I sort of asked for Bare the Bare Knuckle Bastards to be, have a more modern font treatment to sort of feel a little bit more like, where are we in time? Because mm -hmm. I really feel like historicals aren't about history, they're about contemporary. They're just giving us a different kind of wallpaper for a, like a different kind of setting to, to set the contemporary story in. Um, I feel like they're telling the story of people in 2021. And so for me, like, I really like kind of asking that question all the time. I want you to feel like, am I, what am I reading? Like, is it historical? Is it contemporary? Who are these characters? Like, so when the research comes in, it's like, it's all there. It's tightly historical as we talked about earlier, but the characters should feel like you can reach out and touch them. And I really feel like that means they have to be a little modern. And also that's what I'm interested in doing. So the covers are moving toward that. And I think when you see the treatment for Hell's Bells, which is now, so when we do the first cover in a series, we sort of think to ourselves like, all right, what's the series gonna look like? Right. Mm -hmm. So when you see the first cover of Hell's Bells, Bombshell's cover, you'll see like, oh, this is what the series is going to look like. And um, do you I have like a date you or like a time yes. frame? I think it's actually show. Entertainment Weekly is announcing it. I think on Tuesday. So, okay, so the fact that you're oh. like Entertainment Weekly is announcing this, dude, you're like that's a big deal. Oh, yeah. right. It's really it's like, amazing sometimes. Music. Like it's, it's a like little pinch yourself there, but it'll be in Entertainment Weekly on Tuesday, and I'll put it on every. You'll see it on Instagram. Oh my god, that's amazing! Yeah. Yeah. I know. You're, you're that's so amazing. <laughs> No big deal. No big deal. Just like right. just Entertainment Weekly, that's they're just amazing. gonna. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just another magazine. Oh my god. Um, 
I don't any know, other questions? I, think, like, tons, I mean, I think people could ask questions like all night. All but, day, yeah. All day and all night. But thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank and you. Um, give us, um, like, plug your faded mates. Oh yeah! Like, yeah, do it. Yes. yeah. yeah. Um, everything. If you want to hear me talk more about romance novels, which is basically all I want to do, I'd much <laughs> rather talk about them than write them. Um, you can do that on Wednesdays. You can listen to our my podcast, Faded Mates, um, which I host with my friend Jen Prokop, who is a critic, a romance critic, and we are like, I don't know, the only romance author, romance critic friend friends probably ever but here we are um and we host so we host a podcast called theta mates where we do read-alongs and then also where we do like deep dive conversations about favorite tropes and themes this week's episode on wednesday is if you loved bridgerton you should read these other books and okay. why okay. Okay. um okay. so if you loved bridgerton um, listen to that did you plug in your stuff too? Because I saw you <laughs> when you did that. You didn't plug any of your stuff. And I'm like, girl, there's so many books you can plug in for yourself. Like, I know, but Carrie, I can't talk about my own books. Okay, well, read my books too. <laughs> <laughs> and then read these other books. Exactly. You can find more about my books at sarahmcclain.net or you can follow me on Instagram at Sarah McLean, which is really where I like to post pictures of my dog and talk about romance novels. So, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank but you thank so, you so much, it. Sarah, thank for you. coming I on my channel. I have me. to have you back. I, I would love to, to come we're back. Doing, we're doing a Mortals After Dark read along too. <gasps> so like, oh my God, can I come back for that? I will let hey, you know all the details have for you that. Read like, a Mortals that. Wait, are you an Immortals After Dark virgin? No. Oh, no. Um, basically, yeah. I, I only read the first book. This. So now we're reading the whole series. And we actually are using the Fate of Mates reading order let jen and me come that's up. what yeah, we call all, it definitely do it the fate of mates way we know best and so, <laughs> i mean also for everybody to know the first season fate of mates was only supposed to be one season it was just be, supposed to be a deep dive read along of cressley cole's immortals after dark series mm -hmm. um yeah we have a special reading order that you should follow which it sounds like you're yeah. doing well done <laughs> yes, you want, oh my god both jen and i would totally come on so I will definitely message you guys. Come on the podcast, I'll... like come on the podcast at some point and talk to us about it. We would love that <laughs> because I, I I'm obsessed with the series. Like it's so I'm obsessed. Good. I just read Dark Deeds on a <gasps> the Winter's Night. Dark Deeds at Night's Edge, the one with about, about the ghost and the vampire it's who's the crying one. out. Yes, stop it. It's so good. Okay, but Charles, did you notice that she changes the tense of the book in the middle of it? No. Okay. 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 I need to reread it. I'm sorry. You guys, now you can all leave. This is a Cressley Cole video. <laughs> okay. In the, okay. So when you're in Conrad, the vampire premise of this book is this vampire has vampires. If they drink people to death in this series, it makes them go crazy. They keep their, they keep all the people's memories in them. And then they like, they go, they like go crazy literally. And mm -hmm. so Conrad gets caught up in this like bloodlust and his brothers have to go find him. And they chain him to a radiator in this like haunted house in like the bayou of Louisiana. And they ha he has to dry out essentially. Like they have to like mm -hmm. let him become a desiccated corpse essentially. And then like once the blood is all out of him, then he can come back to life. And like, they're hoping that they can save mm -hmm. him. Except they don't know that the house is haunted by this like hot ghost. I yep. As they are. <laughs> as they are. <laughs> just, like, just, like, just normal. But Conrad and this ghost like fall in love over the course of this book. And it's essentially, I mean, like it's just the two of them in this house for what? Three quarters of the book. It's unbelievably mm -hmm. well done. But when you're in his POV, he's in first person present for the first like third of the book. Right. And mm -hmm. then he's, he like, they touch for the first time and it switches to, to third person. Like, oh. and it it's like suddenly he like comes back into himself and like the book pulls out. It's amazing. Go back and read that. I need to read I need to read that scene now. Yeah, I need oh, to. I need to. I just, like, right so that happened that happened on page and I literally was like this is why Cressley's like the best of all of us. 
<laughs> to, the, to the point where this is on my computer, you guys. It says, what would Crusty do? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, she <laughs> she's, writing, she's apparently not writing Monroe, so. I don't know. Yeah. Like, People we're, ask we're me hoping. all the time. I don't know. I promise you when I find out, I'll tell you'll be the first to know. <laughs> <laughs> we asked her to be on the podcast a bunch and she like said no thanks. No. And I mean, I'm I'm we're waiting too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I anyway, agree. sorry about the like extra no, no, 10 minutes I, on no. darkness I, and I said. Yeah. Is amazing. Such a good, such a good book, um, but yes, thank you again, Sarah, so much for joining me on my channel with these lovely co-hosts that Thanks I have for here. Having me, everyone. Uh, stay tuned for Hell's Bells. Go pre-order it. I'll wait on Tuesday. Wait for the cover. Tweet about it. Share it on social media. Everyone's social media links and links are all down in the description box down below. And I'll catch you guys with another video at another time. Thank Bye. you so much for coming. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy, Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day.